Hello guys. Am I audible? You can just write yes in the chat.
of you can see my presentation, can hear me out. If you don't hear me out, you can ping Parag so that Parag can let me know uh, and then I can correct accordingly. But thank you for joining everyone. Good evening. And, uh, you know, it's, it's a Saturday evening. It's an hour session. I'll try to kind of keep it short. But the way we're doing is we'll have around 30, 40 minutes of this session. And then we'll have around 15, 20 minutes Q&A. Uh, there is a link to a document wherein you can post your Q&A. And I'll pick up those questions from that link then, which Parag has shared with me. Uh, if anybody of you have already seen this or heard my quantum computing session, in GDG, uh, which was Google Developer event, which happened a few months back. Uh, this might be a slight repetition for you guys uh, because I've not really changed. Uh, but for newer people who have not been to that event, this will be a great learning what's happening and what is quantum computing all about. Um, so quickly, uh, assuming you still uh, see my screen. So I'm Akash Sureka. Uh, I am an entrepreneur myself. I've sold a couple of companies. I've been working in uh, bigger companies as well, like Motorola, Nokia, NVIDIA, uh, have raised investments, have sold companies. I have recently helped uh, raising $100 million as well for another SaaS company. Uh, and I'm on to my next adventures of looking to create more and more companies in the future. Uh, quantum computing is uh, very interesting uh, and one of the emerging tech. And I think uh, five years from now, this will be one of the most talked about and most used and more practical technology. Uh, a lot of steps have already been kind of taken in this area. And bigger players like Google, Nokia, you know, NVIDIA, uh, Microsoft, uh, Facebook, and, and many others already, IBM, they're, they're working quite a lot in this space. Uh, just so you know, um, I think most of us, uh, even though we have done science in our schooling, uh, we've done physics, uh, we've done mathematics, and then eventually as we get into engineering, we end up more into computer science and electronics and those sort of technologies. Uh, and then we leave behind physics and chemistry and so on, unless you graduate in those streams. Uh, so product of technologies. Uh, and then we leave behind physics and chemistry and so on, unless you graduate in those streams. Uh, so primarily quantum physics is something which is a combination of both computer science as well as quantum or as well as physics. Uh, so in case if you're interested in doing more of quantum physics research or development and so on, what you need to do is you need to get your basics of physics uh, again back to where it was. Uh, I have not done that yet, uh, but if you intend to do deeper research and deeper work, uh, then a lot of physics and fundamentals of physics, largely from a hardware perspective and the way uh, quantum computers are built, will be required. But if you uh, if you intend to focus on the software, uh, on uh, special calculations, uh, probabilistic calculations, and a lot of other things in those areas, which is it's happening in deep learning. Uh, but in quantum physics, it's it's actually not, as I said, quantum computing, it's not about math, it's about physics as far as the computers, uh, the quantum computers are built and, and as far as the way quantum physics is used in building those quantum computers. However, when you have to deploy applications and we have to create applications, that's where you'll have to start marrying your mathematics skills as well on top of it. Uh, but on the face of it, quantum computers from a hardware standpoint is not about maths, it's all about uh, physics. Um, so primarily, uh, you know, as I said, the quantum computer, it actually exploits all properties of quantum physics. You must have heard about quantum physics in uh, fictional movies. Um, you know, you would have heard, you know, you've seen a lot of fiction in, in a lot of high-tech movies like maybe Transformers and so on. Uh, you know, and are used to do certain types of calculations more effectively and more efficiently and more faster, uh, and much, much faster actually than any other classical computer. So that's what about uh, uh, quantum computing means. Uh, I wanted to run a quick video, but maybe I'll run it, uh, you know, after the end of the presentation so that the screen sharing becomes easier. Uh, so we'll come back to this particular demonstration of what it actually means. So how does it looks like? What is a quantum computer, you know, and then so on, right? Uh, uh, what is the environmental sort of dependencies of quantum computers? All that can be seen in that video, which will run after the presentation. Uh, but just to kind of, before we jump on 
uh, you know, how quantum computing works and how kind of quantum computers are made and so on. Let's quickly refresh our memories on classical computing, which we do today, and the way computers are built, laptops are built, servers are built, and so on, right? Uh, so as you all know, it all starts with a transistor. Uh, so I think that's why in engineering, learning about transistors, whether you are electronics graduate or a computer science graduate, or instrumentation graduate, or an IT graduate, it's very essential to learn about how transistors work in terms of electronics. Uh, so basically, it starts with transistor. As you know, transistor has two states, uh, low charge, high charge, based on what you're giving on the input side. And then that kind of in digital world, it gets converts into bits, which is zero and one. So low charge is zero, which is a grounded thing. Then it's a zero. And if it's a, let's say, five volt transistor, uh, then the five volt high charge is nothing but uh, bit one. So that's how uh, transistors are used uh, to define your bits and eventually states, which is zero and one. Then what happens is you apply logic gates on top of it. So logic gates are, again, combinations of transistors, uh, which takes different inputs and then based on inputs, an outcome comes in. So a very minimalistic uh, unit-wise logic gate, as we all know, is AND or XOR. Uh, it is combination of transistors and then based on uh, A or B signal, you get an outcome in terms of what gate it is. Then eventually you what you start doing is you start uh, collecting those logic gates, and that comes a register which you will see in the next slide, which helps you to those slightly additional uh, operations as well. So, for example, you can do addition, subtraction, and so on uh, when you start building up all of those. So, this is how it looks like eventually that gets converted into registers uh, which are there as part of your chip. And in that chip, then when you have different inputs, you have different outputs based on different mathematical operations like subtraction, multiplications, division, additions, and so on, right? So, and you can start doing a lot of things with those. So, eventually, what happens? Uh, this all comes together, and obviously, a lot of other input output circuits, powers, and so on, uh, memory units, all that come together, starting with transistors, then logic gates, as I said, then basic models as registers, then memory around it, power around it, input output, interrupts, all of those come together and it forms a, uh, in, in terms of uh, circuit chip. I'm just checking if you guys can see the same slide, uh, Prague, I'm on slide number 12. Uh, do you guys see that now? Parag, if you can confirm me offline. I think maybe I was on full screen and hence uh, you guys were not able to see my previous screens. Okay, thanks Parag. So I'll, I'll not go in full screen mode, I'll just keep on this. Uh, all right, so uh, Parag, I am actually on slide number 13. Can you quickly confirm me? You guys can see slide number 13. Okay, great. Uh, so, so, you know, Things are working well, right? So you have transistors, you have gates, you have registers, uh, you have chips, uh, you have then supercomputers, uh, and then you know they're helping you to solve complex problems. So what's the issue? Uh, so the issue are multifold. Uh, first of all, let's see from a hardware perspective. Uh, in in today's world, uh, transistors have gone in a much smaller size, which means is a current transistor is 14 nanometers and a lot of research is happening. And I'm sure it would have maybe even reduced further, but this is what the size of transistor looks like on a lower side, uh, as compared to even certain bacterial things like maybe HIV, uh, you know, wherein the size of an HIV is, you know, that particular, you know, unit is 120 nanometer, which is much bigger than transistor. A red blood cell is around seven micrometer, which is again bigger than a uh, transistor, right? So which means is transistors have already kind of hitting the bottom of as far as the size is concerned, which means is in a particular size of the chip, you can only accommodate only particular number of transistors. And as you know, more the number of transistors, more the speed, more the operations, uh, and then better the outcomes, right? So, but however, that sort of Moore's law um, kind of is not getting true day by day. Uh, that is actually falling back now. Uh, that's only getting true by quantum computers now, uh, in fact. So that's one thing on the size of the transistors. It's already a lot reduced, a lot kind of less scope in reducing 
uh, further than that uh, and hence because of that what is happening is for complex calculations uh, you know those are not enough which means is computational power required for complex operations takes much more time because you only have certain number of transistors uh, in a particular chip which can do only certain number of operations uh, based on how many bits you have and, 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 and so on right so here is an example of for example uh, you know a complex operation of figuring out how many trips a salesman is doing across the globe right so if it does only one city it's fairly simple one and you know the computation time taken is very small right but as it starts increasing more and more which means is as you want to add number of cities and then get number of combinations out of it and then the time taken keeps on increasing in fact if it goes to 30 number of cities and you want to calculate the different combination of cities that sales guys would have done you know you know it would take so many years as you could see in my slide right so like multiple years to figure out how much time it was taken for all those combination of cities taken by that salesman to travel across the globe to sell the products and services uh, which means that this is a problem like i don't know if you've heard this story there was this uh, uh, poor guy who was invited by his king in a kingdom because he did something well and then the king offered him uh, you know uh, kind of any price he wants uh, and that time that village was kind of going through a lot of uh, scarcity of food resources and so on and um, yeah, but this guy was actually very smart so uh, you know in fact you know the king actually offered him to play chess with him and actually said if you win i'll give you whatever you want uh, so he actually won because he was a smart guy and then he used a chess example with the king and said you can use the same chess board and you can start with one drop of rice one unit of rice uh, and then you start doubling it for every square in your chess board or on your chess board uh and as king started doing as so king said oh that's quite easy that's not a problem at all and how will you serve all of you people in your village with just little rice on this this chess board uh but this guy was smart and he said you know let's not get to the outcome right now but you start putting up one rice drop keep it doubling every chess square and 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 kind of give me the total rice that will come up once you fill up all the chess boards all the squares on, on the chess board uh, you know with that sort of uh, operation uh, and at the end of it king was surprised you know if you start doubling it you know you can you can actually do those calculations in so many squares uh, king kind of was not able to uh, sustain and you know eventually he actually had to order a lot of rice from outside uh, and the village was happy by ordering that sort of a rice right so which means is uh you know as you start doing more and more operations uh you know you require more horsepower you require more bits and and so on to do all of that right uh similarly some of the areas of encryption uh wherein you know a lot of formulas which are used in encryptions like rs and so on it's fairly easier so if you have let's say z equal to x into y sort of an operation it's fairly easier to find z if you know x and y but it's very difficult to find x and y uh if you if you know z right so it's very hard and that requires a lot of computational power and operations to do that uh similarly a lot of simulations uh you know for example simulations in finding out current virus situation is an example uh to simulate those virus um, you know conditions impact figuring out what's the right uh, you know vaccine for it it takes a lot of operations lot of uh, you know horsepower to do and it takes a lot of time and that's why you could see coming out with a vaccine uh, other than the drug discovery or or other than the trials part of it the drug discovery itself takes a lot of time uh, because of uh, limited computations right now similarly that's you know in the chemi chemical world uh, it's a similar story to try simulations uh, you know you to form different clusters and so on i won't go into details in this right now uh it's a complex chemistry anyway which i don't which it don't track of it anyway so uh so eventually you end up in today's world of using uh supercomputers and uh, you know IBM India Google you know all of these guys are supercomputers but the supercomputers are so big in nature it's not really usable by you know end user so easily it has so many flops gates and so on 
uh, and that can be only used for very heavy performance usage uh, you know in a typical world so they don't make uh, a practical sort of a solution for uh, some of the other you know requirements uh, which requires heavy duty con you know uh, set of operations so that's where uh, quantum physics and quantum mechanics comes in uh, to solve some of these problems uh, and it, they, they solve it in different ways but by the way it's it's quite complex um, you know because it it is actually uh, you know having similar states at the same point of time uh, which means is uh, i might be speaking to you and at the same point of time i might not be speaking to you right so that's what it is so you know some experts say that if you think you understand quantum mechanics you don't understand quantum mechanics right and it has actually an inherent flavor of uh, what it is because it has same state at the same point of time and that's why um you know sarcastically this guy also says that if you understand you don't understand at the same point of time but it is actually true as well it's quite difficult to understand so how does how does quantum uh, mechanics and physics really work together so with physics point of view it's all about electrons and microns which are used to kind of entangle them superposition them and come out with different outcomes right but at the heart of it quantum uh, mechanics is driven by two phenomena one is superposition one is entanglement right superposition uh, i'm sure if you learn music uh you know if you're learning piano for example or harmonium you play two notes and then those two notes get superimposed on each other and you see a rhyme coming out of it right or a sound coming out of it or a note coming out of it uh which is combination of both at the same point of time so that's nothing but superposition uh, and that's exactly what happens in uh you know uh, in quantum mechanics as well wherein you have two different states but at the same point of time right which is exactly similar to what i described in a musical example entanglement right so you know from an entanglement perspective think about it you we will talk about how quantum computers have things like qubits as opposed to bits in our classical computer so think about so many electrons and microns coming to air getting superimposed together how do you make sure that you entangle them properly because understand having microns and electrons and in that environment to hold them together to superimpose them together and get a desired outcome out of it is a very challenging task right so how do you do that so that's all about entanglement how do you entangle those so that you get different outcomes uh, based on those different two bits coming together which are used in uh, quantum mechanics and quantum computers uh so this is uh, you know an example of a cat you know uh, staying in a room uh cat is there in the room at that state and also not there in that state right so a simple visual sort of a you know representation about how you may have two different states at the same point of time using quantum computers um so so you come with those quantum mechanics phenomena uh you know based on quantum physics as well uh, of electrons and microns then you use quantum mechanics of superposition and entanglement all that come together and then you start forming quantum computer so then what what does it translate in terms of quantum computing so just to recap as we said bits are low charge and high charge so you can either have low charge you can either have high charge right so in a transistor you cannot have both the charges at the same part of time you have third charge which is neutral charge in a transistor right but otherwise you have zero or one you cannot have zero and one at the same part of time in a classical transistor model in a bits model of classical computers in qubit which is what is quantum bits in quantum bits because of those properties of quantum mechanics of superposition you can have state two states at the same part of time uh, you know so with the same qubit you can have two states what it means is if you have 20 qubits in your quantum computers this many configurations you can do which means this many operations you can do at the same point of time uh nowadays the quantum computers are even going 100 qubits plus and so on so you can imagine uh, there is 500 qubits which is recently launched by google and you can imagine to rest to 500 and so many operations you can do at a single point of time and that's how you solve those complex problems in a much lesser time as opposed to your classical computers however what it means is this is not like a re regular classical computer as of today wherein you can do this with your A regular ac supply you run your computers 
uh, it, it, it doesn't have to be a very specific environment uh, on its side of cold storage and so on, and it can just work seamlessly. But in quantum computers, as I said, to hold so many electrons, microns, to superimpose them, to entangle them for the desired outcomes, you have to have specific operating environment for those quantum computers, and these are few of them. So if you have very low pressure, it has to be 150x colder than your interstellar space, and, and you can imagine what's the cold temperature of an interstellar space, right? So 150x times of that, which means uh, something very incredible cold environment, and then shielded uh, 50,000 x less than Earth's magnetic field, right? So you can imagine the state of quantum computers it needs to run in. Uh, so, just to summarize, then what's the difference between a classical and a quantum computer? Uh, you know, in classical computer, you have bits, 0 and 1. It's the smallest unit. In quantum, qubit is the smallest unit, uh, you know, similar to bit in classical computers. In classical computers, it prints 0 or 1, one of two values. In, in quantum computers, you can have both of them at the same pod of time. Um, which means is, in classical computers, that's how you know, if you now correlate, when you program, when you write a software, you write this if-else sort of condition, right? Uh, because of this particular nature of the classical computer. So now you can correlate, why do you have to write so many if-else conditions in your software, right? And I'm sure you would be writing that uh, day by day uh, in a lot of applications you would be developing in a software. Uh, however, in quantum computers, it works on the principle of both if this, then that, as well as both. Uh, so you will have different sort of style of programming as well when you write softwares on quantum computers. Uh, it cannot, classical computers cannot perform the math mathematical operations after a certain limit. As I said, uh, when you go to complex simulations and so on, uh, the, the, the capability of, uh, the, you know, those computers are not able to manage because operations then required are quite huge. Uh, however, uh, quantum computers can perform any sort of mathematical operation. Operations. There's nothing which is right now which is not solvable by quantum computers. Uh, and the complex molecules cannot be defined by classical computer. Uh, as I said, in the chemical world, when you deal with molecule simulations and so on, in those industry, uh, that cannot be uh, kind of diagnosed with classical computers, but that can be taken care and defined in quantum computers. So, uh, is this something new? Uh, well, quantum computers are not new. There is a lot of research going on from a lot of time. It's just that the time has come because we have done so much of advancements in classical computers, uh, and we are hitting the bottom of the classical computers now. The, the research on quantum computers have now started uh, slightly more aggressively. Uh, but there is a history, you can go through this, a lot of algorithms which just came out right that time. There was also a quantum Turing machine by David in 1985 for some of the, uh, you know, very basic operations and so on. Uh, and there were a few algorithms were also designed for quantum computers. For example, complex search, how do you do billions of search at the same point of time? And how can it reduce time uh, using quantum computers and so on? And that's why Google is taking a lot of steps in using quantum computers to make the operations faster because you can imagine Google is the only company on the world which goes and indexes so many websites, you know, on a, on a particular instance and get you results so fast. Uh, and they have to make sure that the operations are happening very fast, which means that the caching is fast, the indexing has to be fast, the lookup has to be fast. And they have to even nowadays go and do artificial intelligence on top of it, learn your context and do all of that together in fraction of seconds and bring you the results to have that same experience, right? So, um, so that's how, that's how Google is taking a uh, lot of steps, but some of the companies like D-Wave uh, has come out with its own quantum computer also. It's heavily funded. Uh, they have their own SDKs and so on to develop applications. And that's, it, actually, they did a 512 qubits, you can imagine, in 2013 itself. 2 raised to 513 operations at one instance using that quantum computer, and you can imagine what it can do, right? Um, just to kind of recap, so why do we need this? Uh, you know, I said Moore's law, it says every two years, uh, processing power doubles, uh, but that's not kind of happening so true now with classical computers, and hence you need different technologies, which is where the quantum computers come in, right? Uh, in fact, uh, quantum computers are even beating uh, Moore's law because the number of qubits has doubled every year, uh, which is twice the speed of what Moore's law has set, right? So you can imagine what's happening. 
uh, in, in quantum computers and quantum computers are the one who will keep the Moore's law intact moving forward, not using transistors, but using electrons and microns and so on. Uh, there are different applications uh, which can be done uh, in uh, used in airline mission planning, financial analysis, uh, CAD designing, uh, you have kind of complex media operations, complex imaging operations, you have to do very fast encryptions, uh, decryptions, and so on, right? So all of that are uh, potential applications, which is where quantum computers are used. Uh, most common ones are encryption. Uh, so you can now imagine that a regular 250-bit RSA encryption can now be broken by, you know, quantum computers in just, you know, a matter of time, right? Uh, which was not possible by classical computers, which is a similar example of that salesperson I've told, which takes around years and years to do that, right? Uh, however, with this, you can now break that encryption very quickly. Um, so security is one of the most flavored sort of an application wherein quantum computers are getting utilized. And obviously, you know, a lot of this molecule simul simulations in physics, chemistry, uh, you know, drug discovery and so on. So a lot of places their quantum computers will become more and more visible. So, you know, these are some of the uh, kind of applications I described, security, financial modeling, molecule modeling, even artificial intelligence, you know, in artificial intelligence, a lot of uh, in, in deep learning. So when you have more and more layers in your deep learning networks, uh, you have hundreds and hundreds of layers coming together. That requires humongous number of, you know, operations. And to do those operations in a, very quick fashion of time, uh, you need uh, quantum computers uh, to do that. And this is how the the technical milestone growth has happened in terms of uh, qubits. Uh, it started with uh, you know very small number of qubits, and it actually expanded to a lot, and so on. Uh, even the uh, business case or the computing market is uh, pegged to be around two hundred billion plus in next twenty years. A uh, huge market, and that will keep on growing. And this is kind of still very uh, conservative estimates and, and people feel that uh, it will go much more beyond this, right? You can al already see how artificial intelligence is going. The same market will drive this con quantum computing as well and a lot of newer applications will be able to use those and hence the business opportunity is very huge. Uh, these are some of the companies I said, IBM, D-Wave, Google, Microsoft, Intel, they are all doing work. Uh, some are funded and some other companies are anyway self-driven because uh, they're big companies already. Uh, but they have a lot of activities going on in quantum intelligence, quantum computing, and so on. Um, so, uh, you know, recently uh, Europe has also launched a 10 year uh, kind of a billion dollar flagship project. Uh, they're doing a lot of work in, in quantum computing, uh, just like US uh, and just like artificial intelligence, the way China, US is working on. So, Europe is also taking a lot of steps in doing a lot of quantum computing applications. So, recently, uh, Google quantum computer actually uh, solved a problem in 3 minutes 20 seconds, which otherwise using classical computers would have taken 10,000 years. So you can imagine what's happening with quantum computers. Right? It's actually a boon uh, and, and it will change dramatically the way things are done, uh, you know, via technology. However, as I said, uh, there are challenges as well. So right now, when I show you a video next, uh, hopefully I should be able to share that screen, but uh, you know, you will see the size of the computers are large right now. There are specific operating environments they have to be in, in. There's a lot of error corrections you have to do because imagine, you know, all this mechanics and physics coming together and how do you hold them in that temperature, in that environment, so that the electrons and microns behave the way they're supposed to behave for a particular operation and so on, right? So there's a lot of error correction needs to happen as well. Uh, so those are some of the areas and challenges wherein a lot of those companies are working together. So uh, to quickly conclude, before we jump on any Q&A, um, so a lot of engineering challenges has to be overcome, but they are getting solved day by day. Uh, we have to exploit more and more properties of quantum systems uh, and, and mechanics uh, to kind of make, make them behave appropriately in a right fashion. Uh, will quantum computing replace classical computing? No, so there'll always be a combination and there'll be a hybrid of both. Classical computers will also exist and quantum computers will also exist because for smaller operations you can do at a lesser cost because quantum computers will be very costly in nature, right? And it will not be available to general public like a laptop for a long time, right? So that's really, really long time. So a lot of quantum computers will be used in industrial applications uh, and then kind of data center applications over cloud and so on. 
So that's what I wanted to cover today. But just to end, uh, our famous guy, uh, he was asking his colleague, you know, how is a computer, computer kind of project going on? Uh, and and kind of the, this morning actually says it exists in simultaneous state of both being successful and not even started. Um, and then, you know, the boss asked, uh, can I see it? Well, he said, that's a tricky question, right? So because it's all quantum computing, you can't see it because both of the states exist at the same time. You can all, only see the outcome out of it, what comes out of that. So I'll take a pause and maybe let me try to now play my video. Uh, just give me a sec. Let me try to change. Okay. I'm Bob Sutor. I'm a vice president. Hold on. Let me see. No. Okay. Let me try again. Yeah. Uh, Prashant, can you quickly confirm or WhatsApp if you can see my YouTube screen now? Prashant, if you're there, if you can quickly confirm me offline, if you can see my YouTube screen. Okay, thanks Prashant. So I'm just playing this and you can see how... Uh, IBM Research and I'm responsible for the part of our IBM Q quantum program that uh, deals with our strategy. And I think most important, building up our ecosystem, the people who really are going to be using quantum computers, in particular our quantum computer over the next few years. Uh, this is a prototype model of a 50 qubit uh, quantum computer, uh, IBM Q. And uh, really, if you look at all of this beautiful hardware, uh, it's all in support of what really happens down here at the very bottom. Here. The, the qubits, the actual quantum computer, live down there. And the rest of this, um, as beautiful as it is, and it's an engineering marvel, uh, has to do with uh, getting it cold enough, in superconducting technology, getting the signal all the way from outside down to the, ch the chips itself, and then back up in a clean enough way. Um, and um, so we, we, we filter it to decrease the number of errors. And, and Bjorn, why don't you talk a little bit more about the components here to actually sure. you know, work on that signal. Sure. My name is Buland Kurdi and I am in charge of the IBM Quantum Engineering in Almaden Research Center. So we have very close relationship with our colleagues in Yorktown. And as Bob indicated, the whole idea is to take the chip to a very low temperature, approximately 15 millikelvin, colder than space. Now we're interacting with a chip that's at a temperature colder than space, but our journey starts at room temperature. So our signals have to originate from room temperature, go through several stages of cooling here, and we need to modify that signal, amplify it at places, we need to filter it at places, and we need to take that signal, which is at about five gigahertz range, through coaxial superconducting cables. And then finally we reach to the heart of the quantum computer at that lowest temperature. And then challenges to bring back that signal to the room temperature and do a computation with it. As Bob indicated, at that temperature, we want that state to be long-lived, long coherence. We want it to be staying in that stage, but when we come from outside, we disturb it. So that's the beauty of quantum. Keep it long enough in a coherent state to do the computation and solve all the engineering problems to go from room temperature to the space and back again. Right, that's right. Uh, when it is operating, uh, it's about four Kelvin up here at the top, and it goes down, as Bielan said, to uh, 0 0.015 Kelvin. Uh, so I'm a mathematician. Let me say this right up front. So I don't come from physical sciences. Um, uh, and I'll tell you one thing I, I learned here. These, these pretty little loops here are, are not just here to be pretty. Um, um, it does make it look very nice, though. As this gets colder and colder and colder, the metal contracts, and so the loops tighten up. Um, I live in northern New York. Uh, you see these loops on telephone poles so that the electrical cables don't snap when they get really cold. It's the same idea here. 
Uh, but really, uh, you know, as we said, it's all in support of the quantum computer, which is down at the bottom. Now, what's inside the silver thing? So, in a uh, in a working quantum computer, and uh, remember, this is a model, and we don't open that up, so it's not here. Would be a circuit board that would contain the circuitry for qubits. A qubit is the analog to a classical bit. So in a classical bit, we deal just with zeros and ones. And we put eight bits together, we get a byte, we take a million of those, you get a megabyte, so forth and so forth. Qubits are radically different animals. Um, they are built on the principles of quantum mechanics. Um, while a classical bit is just zero or one, one way to think of a qubit is it has two full extra dimensions of of mathematical variability to compute with. And the qubits can all work together in different ways. Algorithms in a quantum computer are radically different from the way anybody works in classical computers today. Can you give us a sense of uh, some of the types of problems you can address in quantum computing? Well, a lot of the early applications um, are focused on chemistry, and there's a reason for that. Uh, in the early 1980s, Richard Feynman, uh, a professor at Caltech, basically observed that classical digital computers, um, and by that I mean things that are now in your smartphone, your laptop, your desktop machines like that, are really lousy approximations to the way that nature works. And so if you want to compute with nature, such as chemistry, and chemistry underlies uh, biology and drug discovery and material science and things like that, you need a computing model that is much more similar to the way nature works, namely quantum mechanics. So let me, let me give you one example here. Um, and it's, it's of a molecule that most people know and love. It's caffeine. <laughs> All right, yeah, everybody here? I, I'm looking around, I can see live caffeine. One single caffeine molecule has 95 electrons. If I were to just freeze it and to look at its energy state, I would require 10 to the 48th bits. Wow. That's one with 48 zeros. So what can I compare that to? The number of atoms on the Earth are estimated to be between 10 to the 49th and 10 to the 50th. Dang. So you need memory proportional to 1 to 10 percent of the size of the Earth Jesus. to represent this simple little molecule. Wow. Now, with a quantum computer, you could represent that using 160 qubits. So here I'm talking about a 50 qubit prototype machine. You can probably think there'll be improvements over the next few years. 160 is not outside the realm of possibilities. Gotcha. So we have something here in chemistry our well-known caffeine molecule, that is utterly impossible and will be impossible to represent using classical computers, but is certainly going to happen, we would expect, in the next few years as a quantum computer. Okay, so that's what I wanted to kind of quickly show you the video. Uh, just checking with Parag. Uh, Parag, you can still hear me? Can you confirm me, Parag? Okay, thanks, Parag. So maybe I'll, uh, you know, I'll share this video link as well. Uh, but I'll just take a few questions now, uh, which I've shared. So somebody has asked, what does it mean to achieve quantum supremacy? So I think right now the race is how many qubits you can have in a quantum computer. Uh, because as you know, more the number of qubits, more the number of operations or parallel operations you can do. Uh, and that's how you can then solve a lot of complex problems. And hence that's, that will decide your supremacy. For example, the same race what we had in computing where Intel said, you know, I have a one gigahertz and somebody can have maybe 1.2, then Intel said I have two, then I have whatever, right? So the way there was a supremacy race in classical computing in terms of having your CPU, uh, frequency. Uh, the same is in, in quantum supremacy, wherein the supremacy will come in how many qubits you have in your quantum computing. Uh, will this deck be available? Yes, I'll share that. Uh, how would quantum machine learning replace the conventional machine learning? So look, machine learning remains same. The machine learning algorithms remain same. So if you're running a linear regression model, and in example, 
uh, which used to take maybe you know let's say a minute uh, in this it will be done by you know even lesser than micros of seconds and nanos of seconds and so on right so uh, it doesn't replace it helps you to run those algorithms much more faster uh, you, you know what is the scope of quantum machine learning so there's a similar one uh, then is the speed only advantage of quantum computing well i mean the as i said the problems to be solved were related to speed which means is you know if it is taking me for example 10000 years as a google uh, sycamore example what they have solved you know how can i solve it in few minutes uh, i think it's all about speed right and i think uh, as we have more and more complex operations more and more complex problems to solve speed becomes the necessity and hence yes that's the primary advantage of quantum computing as opposed to saying only advantage right so it's a primary advantage uh sir can you point out the chapters in physics we might need this that's a i was not a good physician that time neither i am right now i may have to revisit but i'll figure out and see if i can share something with you guys um how would quantum okay what does it mean okay how complex are algorithms in quantum computing uh well I, as i said quantum computing is all about giving you all horsepower to run an algorithm the algorithms can be as complex as you know some of the examples what i have taken uh for example a decryption algorithm or an encryption algorithm uh now instead of having 256 bit rsa can you run maybe 1000 bit rsa and, and more and more right so uh, it becomes more and more difficult uh, to break so the the complexity of algorithms now could be many uh, because with 512 qubit sort of a scenario uh, you know, you can solve a lot of complex problems anyways. Are there any solution to make them user friendly? Uh, well, so uh, you don't have to worry about the internal mechanics of a quantum computer unless you want to do a research. Uh, but for example, companies like IBM, Microsoft, D-Wave uh, and so on, they have released SDKs. You can use those S SDKs and start programming your software. So, you know, uh, those are I'm saying developer friendly solutions. Uh, are user friendly if it, if you're talking about from a consumer standpoint, as I said, it it will not be available to a uh, lot of uh, common public. As I said in my one of my slides, for a very long time, it will be restricted to industrial use, and a lot of tech users will be using it to design and create applications on top of it. Uh, there are some complex questions between Grover's algorithm and binary search. Uh, maybe I'll respond that offline. Uh, There's not the right forum to answer that right now. Uh, will can we say that quantum computing will be sixth generation? Uh, yeah, I mean it's the this ultimate generation. So <laughs> uh, I don't know what generation will exist after quantum quantum computers. Maybe I'll not be even alive. So. Um, can can I briefly explain the concept of qubits? It's confusing to imagine both zero and one. Uh, so don't think qubits from an electronics perspective. And I think that's where a lot of confusion comes up because as I said, quantum computers are not built using uh, regular transistors of uh, zero and one sort of bits. So don't think about qubits from an electronics perspective. You have to think qubits from a physics and mechanics perspective, which is where uh, the concept of uh, superposition and entanglement comes in, uh, which allows, and as you would have heard or you would have seen Transformer movie wherein that scientist, which is also a bad guy, shows uh, an object which converts into different shapes at the same bit of time, right? Uh, it was converting into a gun, then it was converting into a bird, and it was converting into something else and so on, right? At the same point of time, that was nothing but quantum mechanics and physics. Uh, and that was possible because of qubits. Uh, so don't think about qubits from a transistor or electronics or digital perspective. Think about qubits from a physics and mechanics perspective, wherein, as we know, electrons and microns can have different states at same point of time if they are put up in a specific environment. Right. So some of the environment what I mentioned. How we get started with IBM Q Learning program? Go to IBM Quantum Computing site page. They have signups, developer signups, and you can start doing that. Uh, what makes quantum computing more powerful? Cloud computing. So, well, cloud computing is a 
is a, is a functional domain name it, it's not cloud itself in its own is not a it's not an object right uh, however quantum computers and classical computers are object which makes cloud computing easy when cloud is a is a phenomena used in terms of there are things kept on the back which nobody can see and hence it's a cloud right but it's not an object on its own so uh, don't think about cloud computing as another another object cloud computing was done using classical computing or classical computer servers machines and so on uh, quantum computers will be an additional as a hybrid model of classical and quantum computers which will enhance the cloud computing experience would interfaces between analog computers and quantum computers exist yes so as i said uh, yes so if you see ibm uh, video there will be uh, certain circuitries which will be used uh, within quantum computers as well for certain functions um, and you can revisit that video again why they wanted to use that um, how are signal transmission calculation done in models shown in video um, i didn't get this question properly but maybe i can talk offline on that all right so i think i've covered many of them and i think almost all of them um, so uh, I think thank you everyone for your time. I hope uh, you know uh, you got certain knowledge out of this, and this was helpful. If you want to explore quantum computing further, uh, you can do that, uh, and I'll keep you posted as well soon on any other areas in this. So thank you again, uh, and have a good weekend. So Parag, I think then we'll close it out. Uh, I hope we have covered everything in time, so we good now. Uh, if you can confirm me we're good to close out, then I can drop out from the conference. Uh, I hope we covered everything in time, so we good now. Uh, if you can confirm me we're good to close out, then I can drop out from the conference. All right. So thank you everyone again. Uh, Parag, I am dropping out. Hello. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, can you guys hear me right now? Hello? Okay, so I think I, I guess you can hear me. You can just type yes in the chat if you can. Hello. Okay, so I'd like to thank Akash sir for coming and teaching us, explaining us the quantum computing and its future on this Saturday evening. I really enjoyed the session. Thank you very much. The video will be available on the channel for those who couldn't attend today. You can refer it on the YouTube too. So we'll end the live session. Thank you for joining us and I hope you enjoyed the session. Thank you. Bye and stay safe.